of something dangerous happening in America. There's an extremist movement who does not share the basic beliefs in our democracy. We have right now a country that's under siege. It's under siege. But the country of Mexico is killing us. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. We will never let socialism destroy American health care. They're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some I assume are good people. You don't concede when there's theft involved. If you mistrust everything around you, except for this one leader, you're gonna be very easy to manipulate. The Republican Party is the party of fear. If you were to ask a Republican, they would tell you America is imminently at risk of foreign attack, being actively invaded by immigrants who are committing heinous crimes on every street corner, and ruled by elites and communists who want to take down every last red-blooded patriot in this country until there are none left. And these fears are being stoked by Donald Trump and right-wing media because they know that fear means power. But this didn't start with Trump. Fear is an ingredient baked into the fabric of our political system. In recent years, however, that fear has been harnessed by the Republican Party in a way that makes it uniquely of that party. It gets people to do things they wouldn't normally do, and it has a very real, tangible effect on votes, policy, and the larger political conversation in this country. This is how Republicans use fear to manipulate the masses. fear, being a public-facing person on the internet and starting a YouTube channel is terrifying. As a person who exists publicly, especially a woman who shares her opinions online, I am hyper-aware of the very real threat that data leaks can pose on a person's safety. Data brokers are companies that find your information from all over the place, like in government public records and social media, and then aggregate that information and sell it to other companies. That's where those scammy-looking websites that allow you to like search for people and do background checks on people and stuff, that's where they get that information. If you search your name right now, you might be surprised to find how much of your personal information is floating around out there for everyone to see. Legally, there are very few online privacy laws in the United States. That information can then be used to steal your identity or dox you, and all this data hanging out on the internet can have actual consequences in the real world. But you don't have to live in fear about it. I personally use Delete Me to help me keep my information off the internet and private, which gives me the peace of mind I need to come on here week after week and share my opinions publicly online. For example, last month alone, Delete Me reviewed over four thousand listings and removed my information from six of them, saving me over 25 hours of work if I were to try to do that all myself. Once you sign up for Delete Me, they send you a welcome email and you can get started right away. Tell them exactly what information you want deleted and their privacy experts take it from there. It's super easy and absolutely worthwhile for the peace of mind it provides. You can sign up for Delete Me and get that peace of mind for yourself at the link in the description. And use code LEJA for 20% off your plan. Thanks, Delete Me. Americans generally are more afraid today than they have been in a very long time, without much actual data to back up those fears. Polls show that two-thirds of Americans are worried about being victims of terrorism or violent crime, the highest numbers in 15 years. This despite the fact that crime rates have dropped significantly in the last three decades. This can partially be explained by the realities that we're all facing in a rapidly changing world. Our brains are constantly being assaulted with far more information than we are evolved to be able to process. The problems of the world become very close and very real when we are constantly being confronted with them in vivid imagery on a little screen we can't stop staring at. Despite this widespread fear, however, it's especially pronounced among Trump supporters. Where 51% of the population fear being victims of terrorism, 65% of Trump supporters hold that fear. 63% of people are afraid of being victims of violent crime, compared to 75% of Trump supporters. And fear of foreign influence reigns supreme for Trump supporters. 83% say that the American way of life needs to be protected against foreign influence, compared to 55% of Americans overall. Polling shows that Trump supporters are more fearful of crime and terror, and are generally more wary of foreign influence and social change, far and above the average for most Americans. This fear is being stoked and taken advantage of by Trump and his ilk. When asked, many Trump supporters say that Trump is the answer, that he is capable of bringing order and control to the chaotic and fast-changing world they're terrified of. And they say this because that's exactly 
what Trump is telling them. More than any other politician we've seen, Trump is uniquely able to wield these fears in both concrete and abstract ways to ignite his base of supporters and then present himself as the only possible solution. He's been doing this for years because it works. And it's why his supporters still rabidly support him despite years of proof that he's not only an inept leader, but also actively contributing to the chaos. But fear is not a new feature of US politics. Trump didn't invent this. What Trump has done is very effectively wield, mold, and grow fears that have existed in the United States for centuries. Specifically, fear of the government and fear of others, of outsiders, has played a role in US politics since the literal beginning. Setting aside that the American Revolution was literally a fight against a tyrannical and out-of-control government, since its founding there have always been fears that unsavory elements were taking over or controlling the U.S. government. In the 1820s, it was the anti-Masonic movement that believed that secret societies, the Masons specifically, were trying to control the government. The fear of a cabal of Jews controlling global finance has been around for over a century. And anti-Catholicism and fears of a vast papist conspiracy have always been present in American politics. Catholics in particular posed both a threat to the U.S. government as well as the threat of the other. From colonial times to the 19th century, Catholics were seen as inferior, incapable of assimilating to the American way of life, and devoted to a foreign dictator the Pope. The mass immigration of Irish Catholics in the 1830s and 40s didn't help matters. The anti-Catholic, nativist, know-nothing party briefly became the second largest political party in the U.S. after the collapse of the Whig Party and before the Republican Party took over. Then the Civil War happened, in which a large swath of the population was literally willing to die over their ability to enslave an entire group of people they thought were inferior. And then after the Civil War came the influx of Italians, Eastern Europeans, and Jews, which created a new nativist surge. The Irish were forgotten and in their place, the fear of Southern and Eastern Europeans took root. Whatever group is the latest to immigrate in large numbers to the United States that don't fit the waspy mold, they're the new other that must be feared and resisted at all costs in order to preserve the American way of life. Never mind that that way of life has always included mass immigration from foreigners from all over the world. By the middle of the 20th century, life in America had changed dramatically. In just a couple generations, people had gone from subsisting off the land, barely eking out an existence, to sprawling suburban single-family homes with microwaves and TVs and a new car to buy every year. And with this change, politics became less about the logistics of distributing resources and more about personal identification of self-definition. In 1964, American historian Richard Hofstadter wrote an essay titled The Paranoid Style in American Politics which laid out this history of fear and paranoia that has been a cornerstone of U.S. politics. The essay was also strikingly prescient. 60 years ago, this man warned that the natural trajectory of the paranoid political style of the Republican Party was militancy. According to Hofstadter, the paranoid spokesman is a militant leader. He does not see social conflict as something to be mediated and compromised, but instead, what is at stake is always a conflict between absolute good and absolute evil. The quality needed is not a willingness to compromise, but the will to fight things out to a finish. Nothing but complete victory will do. To the paranoid masses, their spokesman is always manning the barricades of civilization. He goes on to write, again, this was written 60 years ago, very often the enemy is held to possess some especially effective source of power. He controls the press. He directs the public mind through managed news. He is gaining a stronghold on the educational system. As Hofstadter saw it, the Republican Party had been subsumed by a new group of pseudo-conservatives, one that didn't actually want to conserve the American way of life, but instead wanted to undermine it. In their eyes, the world after World War II had been built on the New Deal, which they saw as a liberal takeover of state planning that was a slippery slope that would lead to state-sponsored socialism and, eventually, complete totalitarianism. And Hofstadter's prescient diagnosis of the Republican Party's militancy has been borne out by history. Nixon won the White House on overtures of being tough on crime, playing up the riots of 1968 to instill fear of society's criminal elements. The Reagan Revolution in 1980 brought with it a conservative reorganization of the government meant to undo four decades of New Deal liberalism. And with it came increased use of fear as a means to rally the Republican Party and win elections. A 1984 Ronald Reagan campaign ad warned his supporters, there is a bear in the woods. Isn't it smart to be as strong as the bear? George W. Bush echoed the sentiment in a similar campaign ad in 2004 featuring prowling wolves. By that point, 9-11 had heightened fears of foreign attack and of the other, and of immigrants in the United States across the political spectrum.
spectrum, something the Republican Party quickly took advantage of. Dick Cheney developed his 1% doctrine. If there's a 1% chance that Pakistani scientists are helping Al-Qaeda build or develop a nuclear weapon, we have to treat it as a certainty in terms of our response. Republicans were able to quickly push their foreign and domestic agenda in the wake of the 9-11 attacks. They saw the power that fear had to make people push for more nativist, protectionist, conservative tactics. And they've been playing it up ever since. Whether it's the 9-11 attack used to stoke nativist fears, the wave of immigration from Latin America manipulated into a grand scheme to replace white people with Hispanic voters, or a stolen election based on conspiracy theories, Republicans have spent the entire 21st century using our deepest fears to shape policy and win power. Along with it, the right-wing media apparatus has grown, taking that fear and turning it into a billion-dollar industry that generates countless clicks, views, and a never-ending pile of ad revenue. But no one has managed to harness this fear, the fear that's been built up over centuries and whipped into a fever pitch by right-wing politicians, combine it with the media empire that's been so good at capitalizing on that fear, and use it to his advantage to manipulate millions of Americans into voting for him, quite like Donald Trump. Part of the reason Trump has been so successful is because he's used fear to control and manipulate not only his base of supporters, but also his political endorsers and allies. This has a cascading effect whereby not only is Trump serving up absolute fear-mongering garbage to the masses, but their other Republican leaders are falling in lockstep behind him, thereby legitimizing his words and stoking fear even further. Trump was impeached twice, including on his way out of office in an impeachment that was supported by more members of his own party than any previous impeachment in American history. He also has 91 felony any counts against him spanning four criminal cases, was just banned from conducting business in the state of New York, and a court of law has confirmed he's a sexual predator. Despite all of this, and three years after his attempted coup, he's not only the presumptive Republican nominee for president, he also has the unquestioning support and formal endorsements of almost every Republican member of Congress. He does this, control the voters and the politicians, through fear and the power and manipulation that fear engenders. Specifically, I've identified the seven deadly fears that Trump uses to control everyone from your grandpa in Iowa to the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Fear number one, the fear of ostracization. The thing about all the fears I'm gonna lay out for you is that they play into primal human instincts in a way that's incredibly powerful. Humans need community. They need to be part of a group, not only because there's safety in numbers, but also on a biological level, humans need connection with other humans for survival. We know this inherently, and our fear of being shunned from the group, of becoming a social pariah, leads us to do many desperate things. Donald Trump knows that tapping into that fear allows him maximum control over his targets. By the way, none of these fear mongers tactics that I'm ascribing to Donald Trump are in any way meant to say that he is an evil genius conniving on the sidelines about how to use highly researched psychological tricks to control the American public. Let's not give him more credit than he deserves. Like a schoolyard bully pointing out when you do something embarrassing so everyone else will point and laugh along, Trump simply knows at the innate level of a mean 12-year-old that making someone feel like an outsider is a great way to gain the upper hand. And so he uses this against his naysayers by tweeting mean shit about them until they're run out of office. And his supporters follow suit. A reporter for NBC recently interviewed anti-Trump Republican voters about the backlash they face if they voice opposition to Trump. Jody Sears, a Republican from Iowa, said, I don't talk about Donald Trump a lot because I'm afraid of the backlash. 83-year-old Barbara Spencer, who lives in a senior community in Iowa, said that if you would say something negative about Trump, we had one person that would just go for your throat. That's right, our old folks' homes are going straight wild west over Trump, people. And after NBC posted an interview on social media of a young gay Republican man who didn't support Trump, hateful and homophobic comments poured in, asking him why he's scared of Trump and not scared of getting AIDS from gay sex. This means that even within the Republican Party, those voters who may be against Trump and may not even vote for him in November are being shamed into silence. This has a chilling effect on any discourse and disagreement within the party, down to whether or not someone puts a non-Trump political sign in their front yard. And this self-reinforcing behavior has created an electorate terrified into silence, and it's created a party incapable of self-reflection. And Trump's fear-mongering has professional implications as well. Trump knows this too, which is why fear of professional retribution is second on our list of Trump's seven deadly fears. Republican office holders who may oppose Trump are fearful of doing so because of the very real possibility that it could cost them their jobs. Republicans facing primary elections in 2022 saw that Trump could destroy their political careers. Of the 10 Republicans in the House of Representatives who voted to impeach Trump in 2021, only two are still in Congress. 
The rest left or lost elections, in large part due to Trump's influence in every level of politics. And this extends beyond elected officials. Charlie Sykes was a conservative talk radio host in Wisconsin for 20 years until Trump came along. He was vocal about his skepticism of Trump, a stance that eventually lost him his long-held talk radio position when it became clear that the conservative talk radio audience expected the same level of loyalty to Trump that Trump himself expected. Sykes went on to also lose a job at a think tank, and many of his friends quit speaking to him as well because he didn't bend the knee, as Trump would put it. Careers have been destroyed for speaking out against Trump either by Trump directly or by his ardent followers. And people in the public eye know this, so the ever-present fear of losing their jobs silences them, perpetuating the idea that Trump has unwavering support from elected officials, which then reinforces the support his followers have for him as well. Trump also instills a biblical fear into the hearts of his many Christian followers, many of whom see him as blessed by God. It's no coincidence that Trump and Jesus are often conflated, including at the Capitol on January 6th. In early 2016, a self-proclaimed prophet named Lance Wallnau claimed he had a dream that Trump was sent by God to deliver conservative Christians back from cultural exile. Wallnau is a leader in the Christian revival movement known as the New Apostolic Reformation, which believes that supernaturally gifted apostles and prophets exist today to vanquish demons and build God's kingdom on earth. This is controversial as the Protestant church hasn't recognized apostles other than the first group that Jesus himself appointed. While it's hard to say how many people actually adhere to the official New Apostolic Reformation, many Americans agree generally with its tenets. A 2023 survey found that a quarter of all Americans believe in modern-day prophets and prophecies. Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, and Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, are all associated with the movement. Many leaders of the movement prophesied that Trump would win re-election in 2020. A survey conducted shortly before the election found that 30% of Americans believed Trump was anointed by God to become president. 30%. Which is why, when he didn't win in 2020, so many people thought to their very souls that this was against the will of God. And if you're someone who deeply believes in the Christian faith and comes from a community where these beliefs are paramount, then going against Trump meant literally going against the will of God. And Trump played into this. Several leaders from the New Apostolic Reformation acted as advisors to Trump during his presidency and formed a spiritual strike force called POTUS Shield to protect him from the devil. By voting for and supporting Trump and by storming the Capitol to defend him, Trump supporters believe they are acting on the will of God and saving the soul of America from the clutches of Satan. Through this, Trump is able to wield the literal fear of God to his benefit. Next on our list of seven deadly fears, the fear of foreign attack and influence in America. Throughout his campaign and presidency, and even now as he campaigns for re-election, Trump leans into the ingrained fear that conservatives have of foreign attack and influence. China is out to get us. China. 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 Communists lie around every corner, threatening our values. Make America Great Again is a callback to a time around the middle of the 20th century when white men dominated and communism was being fought vociferously and urgently at every level of government. In Trump's telling, we've gone soft on these foreign elements to the point that they no longer just threaten the American way of life, they have entirely eclipsed it. This once again plays into primal fears in his base, the fear of others and of the unknown, and it creates a great setup for Trump to then present the only plausible solution solution to the foreign menace, himself. Over and over again, with each of these fears, with every threat Trump presents as very real and imminent, he's able to present an easy solution, himself and his willingness to be a tough guy. China threatening our economy and way of life? will cut off ties and end treaties. It's an easy to digest, black and white solution that people who are actively experiencing fear will cling to and believe so fervently that they're willing to overlook everything else because they think he's the answer to their very survival. And Trump has paired this fear of foreign attack and foreign influence with immigration and the Great Replacement Theory in a very powerful and manipulative way. Once again, this outside element, this other, is threatening our way of life. When he's not making blanket statements, about how Mexicans are bad guys, he clings to any example of violence committed by an immigrant to show that immigration as a whole is a threat to people's lives. In doing this, he very blatantly stokes the inherent fear of the other in his base of mostly white supporters. Frank Sherry, an activist who has worked on immigration reform since the 1980s, recently told reporters that the rise of Trump had fundamentally changed the conversation about immigration. What was initially a dispute over laws and policy has become something more profound and primal. Ten years ago, when McCain and 
and Kennedy were working together on comprehensive immigration reform and George W. Bush supported it, I really thought this was a rational policy disagreement that was headed towards a logical compromise. Now I see it as deeply cultural. It's racially charged. It's tribalism. It's us versus them. It's a referendum on the face of globalization, on a moment of demographic and cultural change. Once again, Trump is able to use this fear to then position himself as the most obvious and really only possible solution to the problem. And he presents a simple, black and white solution to ease his supporters' fear, one that is easy to articulate. Build the wall. It's so simple. And Trump is the only one who's willing to be the tough guy and do it. His supporters genuinely believe there's an active threat, and so they now urgently need him for this obvious solution. Trump and his supporters have seen how America's foreign-born population has boomed in recent decades, largely because of the influx of immigration from Latin America. And Trump capitalized on that change, on that fear of the other, both within the U.S. and outside of our borders, in order to manipulate millions and win elections. So he's now got his supporters believing the walls are closing in from all sides whether it's the fear of social or political backlash from speaking out against him, or the fear of black and brown people inside our country and the threats they pose from outside our borders. But wait, don't look up. The threat is coming from inside the building as well. The Capitol building, that is. Because not only are his supporters fear-mongered into believing that crimes are happening on every street corner, they're also terrified of the government too. Spend five minutes on far-right TikTok, I don't actually recommend it, and you will see people screaming about how the government wants to take our guns so they can systematically take out everyone who's not in on the communist global agenda. And the distrust of the government, though distorted through the lens placed on it by Trump and his cronies, comes from a very real and valid place. Many of Trump's supporters are rural and working class. They've watched as the government has regulated their livelihoods out of existence, from coal mining to farming, while also not providing any of the social services necessary to keep impoverished communities afloat. And Trump has developed a frankly rather remarkable ability to speak to those people, despite the fact that if he had it his way, he'd probably never set foot in those communities or shake their ground poor people hands. And he does this by once again playing into their fears. Yes, the government is out to get you. You're right. All your suspicions, all of your objections that the government has written off and ignored, you've been right all along. If they had it their way, you'd have no jobs, no guns, and your entire way of life would be destroyed. And what's the solution? Who's going to protect them from the big bad government that's out to get them? I think you know where this is going. Trump. He's going into Washington as an outsider, even though he's personally known every president since Nixon, and he's going to bring in fresh people who aren't entrenched in the system. And he packaged it in another nice, easy to swallow, clear, black and white solution drain the swamp. Once again, the fear is there, he played into it, built it up and legitimized it, to the point that his supporters feel terrorized, and then he offers himself as the only possible solution. And sometimes, Trump doesn't even need to really package it at all. Because as his seventh deadly fear, Trump has managed to turn the unknown into a scary thing on its own. He not only summons concrete fears like immigrants and the government taking your guns, but also an abstract fear, a fear of suspicion. Fear that there's something bigger going on. Ask many Trump supporters what they're afraid of, and they can't quite put their finger on it. But something big is gonna happen, and it's gonna be bad. And Trump is the one who'll protect them from it, because that's what Trump has told them over and over. He plays into this fear of the unknown, which, as I've already established, is higher than ever in this country, probably because of the greater perceived chaos in a rapidly changing world that we can access with our fingertips on our phones. Everyone feels this increased sense of fear, of dread, of suspicion, and of uncertainty. Democrats and Republicans alike. But when combined with all of Trump's other seven deadly fears, the fear of the unknown closes the loop and covers anything Trump hasn't been able to put his finger on and manipulate. People fear others, and they fear the government, but they also fear another secret third thing. What is it? Couldn't tell you. But based on all this other data, I sure can tell you that Trump's the man to protect me from it, whatever it is. As we've seen over hundreds of years of American history, and especially since the Trump presidency, fear works. Fear is a potent way to get people to do what you want. It's a very easy emotion to drum up, and it is the greatest motivator for people to change their actions in order to make the fear go away. And fear is a really easy emotion to hit with a campaign ad. Politicians have been doing it for decades. Fear is the low-hanging fruit that Republicans love to grab for. And when people are feeling afraid, their reptilian brain takes over. They go into primitive fight-or-flight mode, and all rational thinking is off the table. Trump has made great use of manipulating people's fears of the other, of immigration, of everything we've already talked about. He's made it the centerpiece of his public image. And when people feel anxious, on a psychological level, they want to be protected. They want an easy and clear answer to their fears, a clear solution. Trump offers that. Drain the swamp. 
build the wall. And there's a reason why this works particularly well for conservative politicians. Researchers have found that people who are more sensitive to threats and more wary of the unfamiliar tend to be more politically conservative. We've known this for decades. A 1973 book titled The Psychology of Conservatism wrote, the common basis for all the various components of the conservative attitude syndrome is a generalized susceptibility to experiencing threat or anxiety in the face of uncertainty. Once that fearful mind has been activated, it's ready to look for clues and patterns across any political debates, whether it's immigrants coming to replace us all, refugees as terrorists, or rising crime rates as a threat to your own children and social change as a threat to your way of life. When someone like Trump has managed to activate that fear center, it can be applied to just about anything. And people are looking for something, some other, to displace those fears and those anxieties. And they're looking for a powerful leader who can point them in the right direction and give them the answers they're looking for. Fear and paranoia are extremely important tools for a cult leader like Jim Jones or, dare I say, Donald Trump. Amanda Montell, author of Cultish and host of the podcast Sounds Like a Cult, likens Trump and his language of fear and manipulation to the tactics used by notorious cult leaders like Jim Jones. You become so easy to manipulate when you're kind of in that constant state of fight or flight. If you mistrust everything around you, except for this one leader, you're gonna be very easy to manipulate. Like Jim Jones, whose followers infamously died in a group poisoning meant to free them from the evil forces coming to attack them, Trump has managed to whip up his followers into a frenzy about numerous evil forces working against them, many of which are abstract, yet still pose an immediate and real threat, to the point where they were willing to stage an insurrection in his name. I think their justification for it was, we are following orders from someone we worship who has promised to save us. We are defending something that needs to be defended. I think they they saw it as like preventative in a way. When people call it the cult of Donald Trump, they're not far off. And much of his influence and power comes from his ability to use fear to manipulate people for his benefit. You can watch my full interview with Amanda Montel by joining my Patreon or becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. Other emotions like anger cause people to lash out or act aggressively, but fear makes them cower from the unfamiliar and seek refuge and comfort. When people feel fear, they hold more tightly to what they have and regard the unfamiliar as a threat. As we've already established, study after study has shown that the more intolerant of ambiguity a person is, the more they see control, certainty, and clear answers to things, the more likely they are to be politically conservative. But that doesn't mean only conservatives are susceptible to being manipulated by fear. Studies have shown that when a person, regardless of their political leanings, is made to feel fearful, their immediate response is to reject the unfamiliar and seek comfort in control and certainty. Basically, feeling fear makes you act more conservatively, at least in the immediate term. That's why after 9-11, Republicans were so successful in getting their agenda pushed through quickly. Everyone, Democrats and Republicans alike, was scared and therefore acting more conservatively. And so it creates a self-reinforcing feedback loop. Trump and other Republican politicians play into the fears that have long been baked into the American political system. And when voters are sufficiently scared, they will likely vote more conservatively. Fear also has another interesting effect on politics and voting specifically. Studies have shown that when people feel fearful, when something has happened to make them feel generally afraid for their safety and the safety of the country, voter turnout is lower. This is because fear can also make people feel numb, overwhelmed, and depressed. And because of this, voter voter turnout is also depressed. A study of the 2014 midterm elections in the wake of the Ebola scare happening that year when an infected Liberian man brought the virus to the US was able to isolate how fear of Ebola affected voter turnout. The researchers found that an increase of one standard deviation in voter concern about Ebola resulted in a reduction of votes for as many as 40 Democrats running for Congress. Fear keeps people from showing up to vote. And historically, low voter turnout benefits Republicans because the people most likely not to show up are the ones for whom there are many barriers to voting already in place, like low incomes, lack of access to public transportation, voter ID laws, etc. The older and wealthier you are, the more likely you are to turn out and vote, and the more likely you are to be Republican. Republicans know this. It's why they're trying to disenfranchise as many people as possible. And the more afraid people are, the more likely they are to either not show up and vote at all, or if they do show up, react to that fear by voting more conservatively. And this reality, coupled with centuries of fear and a Republican party that has become particularly skilled at using fear to its advantage, was the perfect storm that created the living monster of Donald Trump as president.
But like I said, while conservatives are more prone to feeling fearful about ambiguity and the unknown, no one is fully immune to the influence of fear. Everyone thinks that they are uniquely immune from being influenced by fear, that they're special and capable beyond the abilities of the average electorate, and therefore this doesn't apply to them. But unfortunately, study after study has shown that that's not the case. We are all susceptible in different ways to being manipulated through fear. For example, many Democrats are willing to vote in Joe Biden again because they're animated solely by the fear of the alternative. And Democratic politicians aren't above using fear to manipulate their base. The problem with the Democratic use of fear, however, is that right now their main tactic is to make us afraid of Donald Trump, and that's it, while offering zero positive solutions other than vote for me instead because I'm better than Donald Trump. That does not a populist leader make. They don't know how to speak specifically to the fears of the voting public, especially those without college educations who turn up in droves for Trump, and then offer concrete, easy to articulate solutions to their problems. Not that I'm saying it would be good for Democrats to manipulate us more with fear, I'm just saying they're generally kind of bad at it, but also are still trying to manipulate us with it all the same. So how do we make sure that we're fighting against the manipulative forces of fear in our politics? First, recognize when you're feeling fear in the first place. Fear induces a feeling of withdrawal, of cautiousness, and a reassessment of the situation through the lens of fear. But fear also causes us to seek out information that reinforces the idea that a threat exists, which is not necessarily the most accurate or objective information. So when you're feeling anxious about something and an Instagram post or tweet thread pops up that reinforces that fear, maybe double check the source before sharing it fact check what they're saying and assess whether what you're feeling in the moment is fear. Just knowing that fear can impact your judgment is a good step in combating its manipulative effects. When you listen to a politician speak, identify if you are feeling fear because of what they're saying. Understand that a lot of times, politicians are saying what they're saying for many strategic reasons. See whether the fear you're feeling is being induced for deceptive purposes, to manipulate how you act or to reinforce a lie or a half-truth. Recognizing biases and questioning the information a politician is sharing when using it to induce fear can help identify when you're being manipulated. Often, public figures and politicians will stoke fear with more conspiracies, which can be spotted by looking at the form of their argument. Are they presenting concrete details that can be fact-checked to voice their position, or are they simply being contrarian or just using questions to poke holes in someone else's argument? If what they're saying can't be fact-checked, their argument may be devoid of substance and just meant to make you feel afraid. And if, after fact-checking, you find that a person or a new source or media type tends to produce more inaccurate or fabricated information, information, reduce your exposure to that source, or consider taking a media break altogether if you find yourself anxiously doom scrolling. Take a step back and assess the actual threat level. How threatened are you by the things you're feeling anxious about in this very moment while laying in bed at 2 a.m. doom scrolling? Probably not very much, at least not in an immediate sense. Give yourself the space to let your nervous system relax so you're not in a heightened state of fear, making you more susceptible to manipulation. Thank you to my Patreon community and my YouTube members for supporting the research and work that goes into these videos. Consider checking out my Patreon community or clicking the join button below to become a member here on YouTube. You'll be supporting my work and getting access to special extra content. You can also get early access to next week's video, exclusive live streams, and so much more. The extra content is the same whether you join as a YouTube member or on Patreon. Your support helps to keep these videos free for everyone and further our mission towards legal and political education for all. Shout out to my newest supporters as well as supporters in my royal tiers and a very special shout out to my multi-platinum supporters Joshua Cole, Thomas Johnson, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, and Brett Piantech. Your generosity makes this channel what it is, so thank you. If you like this video, you'll probably also like my video all about why third-party candidates are not the answer you think they are. Thanks so much for watching, have a good day, Bye bye